Rebuilding peace in South Sudan, a plan that was supposed to end the civil war now in doubt following the controversial replacement of Vice President Priyak Machar. So how does this complicate the already tense situation in the country? And is an international intervention the answer? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Dedi Nabugeda. The world's youngest country is on the brink of more political turmoil, threatening a peace process that took months to come. A faction of South Sudan's opposition says it's replaced its leader and the country's vice president, Riek Machar. So mining minister Taban Dengai is now the acting vice president. Guy was fired by Machar on Friday, who accused him of defecting to his longtime rival, President Salva Kiir's party. But in a surprise turn of events, Machar's own party members backed Guy and appointed him as the interim vice president. Riek Machar left the capital last week and his location is unknown. He insists on returning only if a neutral force backed by the African Union is deployed. Violence between rival factions has killed more than 300 people. It's displaced thousands. So Taban Dengai insists that his appointment is legal. All the journals of the SPLM in opposition, all the citizens, the population, uh, they support peace okay. and they, they want to continue with the implementation of the, of the peace agreement. They also know me that I can deliver. And as I'm saying, I'm just only uh, the, the feeling a vacuum. If, if, if the man uh, come back, Riyak Machar, come back tomorrow, I will gladly step aside if that can bring peace to South Sudan. Well, the world's youngest nation has been engulfed in violence since its birth. In 2011, the country gained its independence after decades of war with Sudan. At least one and a half million people were killed and four million displaced in Africa's longest running civil war. Two years later, the country was mired in a civil war after its president, Salva Kiir, accused his vice president, Riyak Machar, of planning a failed coup. More than 10,000 people were killed and more than 2 million people were displaced. And finally, last year, President Kiir and rebel leader Bachar signed a long-awaited peace deal in the capital, Juba, under the threat of UN sanctions. In April this year, Machar returned to South Sudan to resume his old job as vice president in Kiir's new unity government. But peace was short-lived. Earlier this month, violence broke out again. Two sides took up arms, leaving more than 300 people dead and forcing Riyak Machar to flee Juba once again. Let's uh, bring in our guests for this panel. Joining us from Juba is Ateni Wekateni. He's the spokesman for President Salva Kiir. From Nairobi, we have Peter Adwok Niaba, who is South Sudan's Minister of Higher Education, and he speaks on behalf of Riyak Machar. From Cambridge in the UK, we're joined by Peter B.R. Ajak, who founded the Center for Strategic Analyses and Research and was a former advisor to the government. Uh, Peter Adwok Nioba, uh, if I can ask you, is the appointment of uh, Taban Dengai as an interim vice president legal? Yes, it's illegal. In fact, it is a coup, and, and a coup was in the SPLM, SPLAIO. Uh, this is because what it has shown now is that uh, uh, <clears throat> what happened yesterday is a, rev a revelation that uh, the mall that has been inside the SPLM uh, SPLAIO has become has come out clearly. This is what the role Taban has been playing since December 2015. He has been, uh, in fact, uh, betraying has betrayed the, the 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 SPLM in all that he has been doing since that time. Why so is this illegal? Last, yeah, Why is this a coup just, when, uh, when the vice president, Riyak Machar, uh, has missed the deadline to return to Juba, his whereabouts are unknown, and, and this appointment of the new vice president is reportedly temporary until Machar returns? Dr. Riyak did not get, he got out of Juba not by his own accord. He was forced out of Juba. There was a military action against him by Salfakir. And it has become clear that Taban was part of this conspiracy. Uh, <clears throat> so his appointment now by just five members of the political Beru, comprising 23 members, uh, shows that this is, uh, the, the, the coup has been hatched. And this is what has been going on in the circles 
of uh, the, the Party of self Fakir and the Indian Council of, of Elders. What can who, you tell us about when Riyak Machar will return to Juba then? And what can you tell us about his whereabouts? Well, there is no vacuum. Riyak was forced out and he can only come back to Juba on the deployment of the third party intervention force. This is what we have said and it's clear. Now what the Taban is doing is so, is so desperate. It's a desperate attempt to, to, to destroy the peace agreement and this plays into the hands of self Akir and the Gian Council of Elders. Atani Wakatani in Juba, a spokesman for Machar, has said that they have evidence that Deng was secretly working with Kier for many months. What can you tell us about that? What kind of relationship uh, do the two men have and what kind of knowledge did Kier have of this new that appointment? Is, that is not true, although this is purely a business of the SPLM, SPLAIO. It has nothing to do with the government of uh, South Sudan and uh, particularly has nothing to do with President Salva Kiel. Uh, in the interest of peace agreement, um, I would say uh, if uh, the SPLM IO has chosen uh, Taban Dengai, uh, then why would um, Dr. Peter Raduok call it uh, unconstitutional or call it um, illegal when in actual fact uh, the SPLM IO should not be uh, a business of one person called Riyakmachar? Uh, though, though I don't speak for them, but for the interest of peace, um, uh, we ever has now remained because the office of the first vice president has remained vacant for more than uh, two weeks. And I do, uh, you know, I disagree with the professor at work that uh, Dr. Yagmachar was forced out of Juba. He was not forced out of Juba. He forced him out of himself out of Juba because he think you know somebody else would actually be doing uh, a job for him instead of, uh, of him sitting with President Salva Kiir uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to implement peace agreement. If so President do you Salva truly Kiir believe was, uh, that Deng the one is the man that, then Maria, to move the peace Yagmachar process along, along, Cuba, along with Salva Kiir? He would have, he would have, he would have done away. Yeah, yeah, actually, they went along. That's why uh, you know, President Salva Kiir is spared his life during the, uh, the, you know, that fateful night of Friday, the 8th. President Salva Kiir al allowed him to go. And, and that indicates that President Salva Kiir was willing to work with, uh, with Dr. Machar. But if Dr. Machar has chosen to leave because simply he was do, looking for, uh, for the third party force, he did not know that, you know, uh, you know last time it was him who uh, insisted on two armies. Then when he was allowed to have it, an army, his army came and attacked, uh, you know, uh, the forces of, uh, of, uh, of government. So when, when his forces were uh, actually defeated, is now looking for the third party force to come to Juba. What he is looking for, he wants to have upper hand and take over power in Juba by force. Otherwise, Dr. Adwok would have agreed with me that President Salva Kiir is not the one who has actually instigated the, 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 the fighting on, on, the, on the Friday, uh, you know, uh, uh, the 8th. Okay, so Peter Dr. Vira Ajak in Cambridge, alone, and therefore what does this it is constitutional for the SPLM IO to replace him. Peter, in Cambridge, what does this appointment mean for Salva Kiir? Is it a political victory for Kiir? And what does this mean for the peace process? Well, I don't know exactly to what, what role the President Salva Kiir has played uh, in this dynamic. Of course, uh, with this crisis in South Sudan, uh, there have been a lot of rumors uh, moving around about shifting allegiances. And by the way, it's always important to keep this in historical perspective, uh, that there's a large history here in South Sudan involving Machar and Taban Deng. This is not the first time that they left together and then they returned separately. And these alliances have always changed. And this has been the case in South Sudan with different actors defecting and then defecting from one side to another. So I don't know exactly what extent that uh, the, the president has played in this role. But what is clear is that the president gave uh, uh, Riek Machar a, a timeline of 48 hours to report to Juba. And uh, it seems that that timeline has, uh, has, has, has now elapsed. But the issue here is, is to think of a peace agreement broadly beyond any individual, but also broadly in looking at some of the key tenets of the agreement, especially the security arrangement. Uh, the latest crisis is started with security arrangement falling apart. As you all remember, the, the conflict started while the president and the first vice president were meeting. And this conflict uh, then spread out 
uh, to the extent that the vice president and his forces were flushed out of Juba. And what has followed since then has been a recommendation from the IGAD and the African Union that you need is some sort of force that will provide security in Juba and in other parts uh, that are sensitive uh, so that the agreement can resume and be implemented. But the question is, what is the timeline realistically? When can we expect uh, these forces to arrive in Juba? And then in the meantime, what is going to happen with the peace agreement? Uh, but one thing for clear is that there is a, a, a power struggle within the SPLMIO. This is clearly the case. There is a power struggle now between uh, Riek Machar on one hand and his supporters, and uh, Taban Dengai on the other hand and his supporters. And this power struggle is quite frankly dangerous uh, to the peace agreement. On the point of the regional forces, Eteni Wekateni in Juba, uh, President Salva Kiir, we understand, has said that he would not allow additional international forces into the country. Why is that? Well, uh, you know, uh, the president has made it categorically clear that uh, the, the forces of United Nations that are in South Sudan are more than 12,000. But they could not do anything at the time when the, uh, Dr. Machar forces, you know, attacked our forces. In order for us to be talking of increasing international forces in Juba, when in actual fact, uh, the people of South Sudan are capable of, uh, of, of running their own country, uh, you know, in the interest of the, of the uh, peace agreement, in, instead of increasing international uh, peacekeepers in South Sudan or regional force, uh, President Salva Kiir and the people of South Sudan would not want uh, more forces. How are the, uh, how are the people Machar of South Sudan uh, capable of running their own country when, when President residents Kiir of South President Sudan, in fact, say they are frustrated with the government and they say that your government yes. has failed, failed to ensure peace and stability? The, uh, our people, our people are made, uh, our people are made to, to feel frustrated, are made by those who wanted to help us when, when in actual fact they are not helping us. Our people are actually, uh, uh, you know, advised uh, to leave us. Our people are uh, actually um, given wrong information in order to leave South Sudan, when in actual fact there's no any better place for them anywhere. Uh, people of South Sudan are here better in South Sudan than in another country in the world. So uh, they, uh, the, the people of South Sudan are also victim of the, 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 the miscalculated, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know uh, scenario whereby uh, uh, the, the IGAT came with, with a peace agreement that says there has to be two armies. And uh, when we argued this, we were forced to sign a peace agreement which uh, includes uh, the two armies. And the two armies became fatal. Now they are trying to look for another way out by saying that it is the regional force or uh, the third party force that would actually guarantee Well, there peace is for another idea, when Peter Adwok Niaba from Nairobi. In Congo, okay. They are in Central Africa Republic. They are in Somalia, uh, but they have, not, they have not brought peace to those places. All right, let me, let me put forward another idea. Uh, Peter Adwok Niaba. Well, let me ask you about this idea that's being floated around. It was put forward by the former U.S. Special Envoy to Sudan and South Sudan, and they are saying uh, that South Sudan needs to be put on life support by establishing an executive mandate for the UN and the EU to essentially administer uh, the country until institutions themselves in South Sudan are able to take over. Uh, what's your reaction to that? The peace agreement was supposed to help the, the state and to really reconstitute the state in South Sudan. Because today, as we speak, after the withdrawal of Jack Mechar and his forces from Juba, we don't have a national army in Juba. We don't have national security apparatus in Juba. The forces in Juba are all tribal, directed by the GN Council of Elders. It's not a, a national army. And that's why we insist that in order for us to implement the peace agreement, there should be a third force. Because Juba was supposed to be de demilitarized, the <coughs> self -care and his people refused to demilitarize Juba. They were pretending uh, and showing... Okay, so just for clarity, when you speak about the third out. force, what are you but referring to? Are you referring to a regional force or are you referring to this idea that I've just asked you about, about establishing well, the, an executive mandate force, for the UN the and the AU uh, to administer South Sudan? No, there, but we are talking of implementation of the peace agreement. Unless we say that the peace agreement has collapsed, and in this sense, we can talk of UN stewardship or UN mandate on, uh, in South Sudan. Well, do but you still have hope that the peace agreement can be implemented under the current circumstances? 
We believe that it can be implemented. If you were in and other major towns in South Sudan are demilitarized. Because as I said, there is no national army in South Sudan. As of the <coughs> December 2013, what has remained are all tribal uh, armies carrying arms. And you need to demilitarize them to make it peaceful. And that's why in Juba, people, <coughs> we, we had only 1,300 troops. It's not that force that, that dispersed the people, that went to kill people in the UN. Uh, in the UN uh, uh, protection of civilian uh, uh, camps. It was not the uh, IO forces that shot and killed the Chinese peacekeepers in Cuba. So this is why we are saying that the, 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 we, have a, we have a tribal army, militia, who do not even answer to any central command. That's why they need to be demilitarized and, 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 and disarmed. Say so that we, Cuba is peaceful, you can have the transitional government of national unity, unity operating uh, effectively in order to make okay. the reforms. All right, the uh, Peter, Peter B.R. Ajak. In uh, order to bring the state back on its leg. Uh, Peter B.R. Ajak, how likely is all of this to happen that uh, the country is demilitarized, that the tribal militias are demilitarized? And also, let me get your take on this idea that's being floated around in the international community now about a possible international intervention that I was asking my guests from Nairobi about. Well, I understand where the, uh, where the recommendation is coming from. This is uh, coming from uh, very respectable people like Princeton Lyman and uh, Kate uh, Elmquist Knob. And the two individuals have spent a lot of time working on South Sudan. Prince Alignment was the special envoy uh, to Sudan and South Sudan and was heavily involved in the implementation of peace agreement and the referendum that led to the independence of South Sudan. Uh, so I understand the frustration that has been coming from, because indeed, to be fair, uh, South Sudan government has struggled enormously to, to exert its sovereignty internally in the country. Uh, every day you read about uh, innocent people that are being killed by unknown gunmen. As we speak, the country is on the brink of economic collapse. Uh, there is humanitarian crisis that is unfolding in many parts of the country. So these are true, true uh, uh, concerns. However, uh, what is being proposed, uh, UN, AU administration, is uh, akin to trusteeship. And it, it, the United Nations uh, uh, Charter uh, makes it quite clear that uh, trusteeship is something that cannot be imposed on an independent state. And South Sudan is a fellow member of the United Nations, and, and, and therefore there's no legal precedence anywhere in the world for an independent state uh, who is a member of the United Nations to be put under trusteeship. So that is, uh, first of all, quite problematic. Second is this issue of demilitarization of towns, and, 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 and especially Juba. This was proposed during the negotiations, and the two parties, it's not just only the government that rejected this, but also the I.O. also rejected this idea. Uh, and even the idea of, of bringing in a third force that could um, uh, impose peace and ensure security in the country was also proposed, and it was rejected. The likelihood of this happening is quite problematic, because as Atenya Wack said, and I think even Adwok Nyaba himself would agree, this current security arrangement uh, of two armies in the country is extremely problematic. We have seen that this has been a, a total disaster. And it would never work. It would actually make it impossible for the security sector transformation to take place in the country, because the two institutions of the armies will be, at, will be attached to particular individual. The SPLA will be seen as loyal to Salpakir, and then the other SPLA IO will be seen as loyal to Riyak Machar or Taban, or Taban Dengai, regardless of who is in charge of the IO. Okay. This is quite problematic, because the security institutions of the country ought to be loyal to the country. And because of this peace agreement, which separate these armies and legitimize them in the country, it's difficult then to build coherent national armed forces that are then loyal to the, to the republic. All right. So, well, the latest QA escalation in violence in South Sudan has, in fact, led to widespread displacement. As we've been hearing, more than 26,000 people have crossed south into Uganda since fighting broke out earlier this month in around the capital, Juba. More than 90 percent of those people are women and children. On Friday, a record number of 8,000 people braved heavy rain and waded through muddy roads into Uganda. The UN saying this is the largest influx of people on a single day this year. And an official at the UN camp in Juba says 470 women are internally displaced camps and they've been raped since fighting began in July. 
More than 300 people have died in fighting between rival groups and attacks on aid workers have also increased significantly in the past few months with reports of rape as well as uh, robberies. Uh, Peter Adwak Niaba in Nairobi. So you see the effect that this, uh, uh, the civil war initially had and then uh, this infighting is having on your people in South Sudan. Just how much is Riek Machar willing to compromise uh, to put the country on the path of peace? If uh, Taban Dengai uh, turns out to be a better acting vice president, a better vice president rather, who will move the country towards uh, peace, is Riek Machar willing to step aside and step down? Well, <laughs> it's not an issue of compromise. First, who is controlling the I.O.? It is Riek Machar. Taban has no forces. He had only five people who voted him to be the, to act in the, the place of Riyadh Meshach. Is that going to bring peace, even if Salfa Keir appoints him tomorrow as the first vice president? Okay, what is Will going to bring, bring peace? peace? To South Sudan? I don't if you can so. give me a, a clear and concrete answer, what, 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 what will we bring are peace? Saying, what we are saying, what we are saying, and I agree with Peter, that the, the, the very concept of two armies is staying together uh, an army that, uh, two armies that have never been uh, integrated. It, it's a real disaster. And this is, it has been, it, the recent events have proved that. What we are saying is that you have bring in a third force, a third force with a mandate, with a mandate of protecting the civil society. Because you've just said that the pe people are running away. Are they running away from who? You should ask that question. They are running away from the same army, the, 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 this, this tribal militia. Because most of these people who are running to Uganda are Equatorians. Are Equatorians who are being displaced from their house, whose, whose lands are being taken over okay. by this, uh, this, these tribal militias. Okay, so Atani, Wakatani, and Juba. An external force, a regional force, and has, and has that been agreed by the regional body, the IGAD, the OEA? AU has agreed, and they have asked the, EU, the United Nations Security Council to endorse that. What is the problem now? Atani, uh, can you, you answer that? Problem, what is the problem? Is agreement. this what is going to bring uh, peace to South Sudan? And yes, what is President yes, yes, Salva uh, Kiir yes, willing okay. to do? How much first is he all, willing to compromise? First of all, it is unfortunate. Yeah, first of all, it is unfortunate that you know our people are made to leave the country because of uh, a miscalculated um, idea of having two armies which actually caused the fight in Cuba. And as a result, people started running away for safety. Uh, but at the same time, when you look at the Minister of National Unity, you know, uh, the way he's talking, uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Aduok Nyaba, uh, as if, you know, he doesn't like anything tribal, when in actual fact, he accepted to be nominated to be a minister, okay, in the government of national unity under the ticket of an organization that is 90 or 99 percent one ethnic group. For the interest of Duk time, I ask you to answer to my question in a minute or less about uh, side, what will bring peace the, to the, the country army. and not uh, sorry, take sorry. and not make yeah, this of personal. Course, of course, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm saying, I'm saying the army, the army, Professor Adwok, the army is calling a tribal army. Is the same army that liberated this country? They were not told that you were actually, uh, you know, tribal when they were liberating this country. And Dr. Adwok know this, you know, correctly. Uh, the problem is uh, because uh, the ministers, even like Adwok, are, are looking for a, a third party force in order for South Sudan to be taken into trusteeship in order for them to be able to work because they, they, they know that people of South Sudan will not vote them in later on if they are looking for a position. And they wanted to leave there in a position until they die. If they, they really know that people of South Sudan can vote for them, they cannot advocate for third force or to advocate for a, a third party force which will culminate into um, uh, you know, an anarchy in South Sudan because all the third party powers will come as an invaders and we will not allow them to come. We will, will not allow invasion to come to South Sudan. Okay. People of South Sudan has the capacity to address their own issues. And Dr. Adwok Nyaba knows this. On that note, we'll leave it there. Thanks to all my guests, Ateni Wekateni, Peter Adwok Nyaba, and Peter B.R. Adjak. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, you can go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From myself and the whole team here in Doha, bye-bye for now.